before I get into that, I wanted to just say thank you for coming. This is our Wicked Sea Aquarium seminar series. We're getting started after kind of a, a long hiatus over the summer, um, but we from now on should have about one a month at least. Um, next month, it looks like we're going to be doing whale entanglement with Ed Lyman from NOAA. Um, we tried to do this earlier in the year, but then um, they had the federal shutdown and we had to cancel our talk. Um, but we rescheduled it and it should be on November 26th. And once we get those dates for sure, we will um, send that out. But as of right now, it's on Monday, November 26th. Um, no, no, not your iPhone, but the reef. Oh, yes. And we are also having on November 13th an Eyes on the Reef training. So if you'd like to become kind of a citizen scientist and go out and identify things like coral bleaching, um, crown of thorns, predation, things like that, the training is on the 13th from 6 to 8. And if you want to RSVP, you can just um, email us through the same email that you, you um, signed up for this talk at, or you can just come see me and we can sign you up afterwards. Um, so thank you for coming. And with that, I'd like to introduce Kabika Winter and Rob Tonin, both from Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology. And they will um, be talking about some of the research they're doing in the Ia fish pond area, or the Ia area. All right, well, thank you. Let's welcome them. So we're going to do a bit of a tag team presentation. Um, can I start with asking, are any of you from Windward Side, the region? Well, I was, but I don't know. Okay, so um, Peia is the newest reserve in the National Estuarine Research Reserve System. So this is a federal program uh, across the United States that had 28 sites prior to Hawaii uh, being added as the 29th site in the National Reserve. And this is a federal state partnership that um, allows people basically to have uh, an area that is set aside for um, understanding what is the best way to manage or to conserve these estuarine ecosystems across the country. Um, and they're really designed to study, uh, communicate, and to help educate the public about the importance of estuarine systems. So this has been an idea that has been a very long time coming. So for those of you who are familiar with Kamiwe Bay Master Plan, this was a long state process with a great deal of public involvement by the Office of Planning to ask what did the community want out of Kaneohe Bay? And one of the things that came out of this planning document was a suggestion from the community that we should consider the possibility of a marine sanctuary or a National Estuarine Research Reserve for Kaneohe Bay. So that was back in 1992 and for what seemed like a lightning fast process for NOAA, seemed like a glacially slow process for the community, we went through an established uh, procedure, basically. There are three phases to establish a National Estuarine Research Reserve. So after many years of discussion between the state and the federal agencies, uh, the governor, uh, Governor, um, Abercrombie nominated the site to NOAA. The Office of Planning takes over and runs criteria, looking at sites, sites across the entire state and on all of the different islands, can apply and, and propose what they think is the ideal location. There's a public review process and, and they find out if the community is in support of this idea and so on and so forth. Um, and you go through this process that was finally designated January 19th, 2017, and in July 2018, we have finally gotten to the point where we have hired new staff, such as our reserve manager, Kavika, who will be taking over shortly. Um, the site that we're talking about is about 1,400 acres, roughly. 1,385 acres of land. Here, uh, an, a wetland area that is managed by Kako'o Iwi, if any of you are familiar. So Kako'o is one of the uh, Native Hawaiian restoration groups. 
who are looking at trying to remove alien invasive species in this wetland area and trying to restore uh, Loi Palo, traditional taro farming uh, practices. Here, Paipaio Heia is one of the, another uh, nonprofit group who is restoring and managing the fish pond. And then DLNR is uh, the agency in charge of all of the submerged lands and the state park. This is Heia State Park here. And then the University of Hawaii is the uh, owner and manager of the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology and the Hawaii uh, Marine Reserve that is surrounding the reef of that area. So all of these groups are partners who together have a shared vision with many other groups in this area, uh, most notably Ko'olau Poco Hawaiian Civic Club, Ko'olau Foundation, uh, in addition to the, the groups that I've mentioned previously, the Department of Land and Natural Resources and the Hawaii Community Development Authority who have the, the management uh, jurisdiction for this area. But there are lots of partners, lots of groups working in this area and all trying to develop this project that came up with a, basically a, a shared governance charter. So all of these groups basically got together and agreed that the designation of a near in this area doesn't change any of the rules, it doesn't change any, uh, any of the existing regulations, it doesn't stop fishing, it's not a sanctuary or that. Everything that was in place beforehand still exists and it still has the same rules. It's Department of Land and Natural Resources still sets fishing regulations the same as they always have. But that we all agree to try to work together on this shared vision with NOAA, the Office of Coastal Management as the federal lead, the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology as the lead state partner, DLNR and HCDA, Pai Pai Ohiia and Kakoi Ivi, Ko'ola Poko Hawaiian Civic Club and Ko'ola Foundation working together to try to ask the basic uh, research question, how is the best place, to, what is the best way to manage this site? And so one of the things that was very important in, in establishing the shared vision is basically talking through the kupuna. So, for example, Uncle Jerry uh, Kalahiva, who was the Konahiki of this place, he just recently passed away and is a great loss to this, but we still have Auntie Alice Hewitt and, and others who are continuing to guide us, Auntie Rocky, um, who have been very instrumental in telling us what did the place used to look like, what were the traditional practices, and what is the vision that we would like to see restored for this place. And when we're talking about the fish pond and the wetlands here that we're, we're talking about, we're basically asking the question, is it possible to restore a functional ahupua'a in an urban setting like Kaneohe on the island of Oahu and ask the question, does that management strategy work better for the people of this place than the current management strategy that we have? And I think I'll turn it over to you to talk about Ahu Pua. So, hello everybody, this is Bill Clare. I'm the new reserve manager at the uh, Hihia Nier. And um, so I am newly hired, been here since July, and uh, Part of the work that I have been doing for uh, most of my life since I was uh, young, small child, is Ahupua'a restoration. Oh, I didn't know. Thanks to here. And so it's something I've tried to understand by hanging out with as many elders as I could and um, you know, looking at whatever research has been done. And now that I'm in a point in my life where I'm doing research myself, trying to push forward that envelope of understanding how Ahupua'a work, how the traditional resource management system works in Hawaii and how that can be applied in the 21st century. So this is a graphic, a figure of the moku or the, the district of Ko'olau Poko and all of the Ahupua'a it contains. So starting in Kaneohe, Kaneohe and then Heia, Kahalu, Waihe'e, Kaalaya, Waiahole, uh, Waikane, Hakihu, and both Kualoas. So that is the moku that we're talking about. And uh, Ra 
up on that earlier slide had a picture of the kupuna. The kupuna, they always talk about pohola popo. They talk about things in the context of this moku. Um, and there are many reasons for that that I'll go into, but just to reiterate the ahukua'a, the traditional community that we're working with, is in Heia, which is an unusual one because it extends across the bay and continues over to Mokapu over here. Um, but just for some context, the near is in this area. This is Kapo Uiwi's land, the wetland, the fish pond, HIMB. We got kind of managing this 1,300 acre area. Um, so this is some research that was just recently published, I think two weeks ago. Um, for pretty much the time I was small, actually starting in the 1950s with Mary and Kelly, people who were looking at uh, traditional Hawaiian resource management systems uh, started describing them uh, as the Ahupua system. Uh, the reason for this is because Ahupua is, for lack of a better term, a community. It's a community of people, it's a community of plants, it's a community of fish and birds. It extends usually from the mountains out into the ocean, not always, uh, but usually. Um, but then, you know, Ahupua's limitations. If you're looking at uh, population dynamics of fish and birds, uh, even uh, gene flow and things like that, even with human populations, the same kind of things, they aren't limited to ahupua'a boundaries. So if you have a boundary goes through, the, a duck doesn't know where, whether or not it's flying over, and people too, people have friends and family on the other side they're gonna be engaging with. So by limiting things to an ahupua'a scale isn't really uh, fully emblematic of the traditional system. So there's been a few of us have my friends and colleagues here that have uh, had, a, had a, you know, been finding the term ahupua system prob problematic because there's limitations, and so we've been looking at a uh, different way to describe it. So then the one we've came up with is a moku system. So within the context of a moku system, you have multiple ahupua. So we have just, this is just a schematic figure, not based on anything in reality, so to say, but it was, this model was based on ahupua on the island of Kauai on the north side, where I've been doing work for uh, the past 13 years before I got into my position. But every ahupua has these social ecological regions. So, um, and this allows for, so I'll, I'll just go into them. So the Waukanaka is generally the habitation zone, the place where you're living, you're farming, you have your aquaculture, you have your uh, temple worship, your recreation, that's basically uh, where humans are allowed to be quite often. You have your waulaau or your agroforestry zone, your lowland forest. Uh, well, Nahele is remote forest that is typically not managed um, and only accessed by, in the ancient times, by the bird catchers who would go up there and uh, collect feathers. Uh, the Well Kele is a permanently saturated forest that's below the cl cloud line. And Wawakua is a sacred forest that's hidden by the clouds. Um, so uh, again, this is modeled off of uh, the system of Kauai. It wasn't necessarily like that in all islands. Uh, it is very similar. Uh, in my uh, assessment in the area we're working in Hei and Koala Poko. Um, so the beauty of this, the way the system worked is within one ahupua, you can manage all of the resources, all of the ecosystem services within your ahupua um, and have enough to live. But if that's all you live by, you wouldn't be able to have, uh, really it wouldn't be sustainable for the long term because you need to have gene flow back and forth of, of fish and of birds and of humans to be a, a functioning dynamic system. Um, and so when we, Kind of compare this to this earlier slide. If you imagine that, this is the moku, and here are our, our, our ahupua. But again, when you listen to the kupuna talk or the elders talk, they talk about koala poko because really it's that larger unit that's um, uh, what they what the, the, the unit they, they think about a lot of. Um, so uh, some other research that we've been uh, publishing recently is the applying the keystone concept in social ecological systems. So social ecological systems is a term for a system that recognizes that humanity is a part of nature and you can't separate uh, humanity from natural systems. Any kind of line you try to draw will be arbitrary and artificial and won't be uh, actually enforced by uh, data. And so social ecological systems is, is something that uh, a few of us have been embracing as a way to um, translate uh, ahupua thinking or moku system thinking into uh, science and academia. And so we've been applying the keystone notion into that. So what is the element that holds the whole structure of the old Hawaiian system together? Um, so 
we looked at a whole broad diversity of things and looked at um, uh, rain fed systems of agriculture, agroforestry, flooded field systems. And the reason why we focused on agricultural systems is because uh, communities and societies tend to be developed around their kinds of agricultural systems. So uh, in places in Hawaii that was predominantly rain fed, they had a certain societal structure built around it. Areas that had more agroforestry had a slightly different kind of societal structure and flooded field system like lo'is and uh, things that we're familiar with had a, another kind of structure. Um, and so we went through this process of looking at functional diversity within social ecological systems and looked at where the dominant components were. And um, anyway, it comes out, I'm not gonna go through all the details, but Kalo is a really uh, unique outlier in this whole system, which uh, means it's something that we should look at a little bit more closely. And it turns out that um, Kalo, or Kalo, the cultivation of Kalo specifically seems to be the keystone component of the whole Hawaiian uh, resource management system because the keystone component, again, where this term comes from is this uh, architectural metaphor where this is the one component within a structure that doesn't have functional redundancy. So if you were to take this piece out, this would all collapse and then you could rebuild something, but without this here, you could never rebuild that. So you could build a wall, you could build a tower, but you couldn't build an arch. So applying that metaphor into the Hawaiian system, it seems to be in places that had a lot of water, it seems that Kalo cultivation was the keystone component. So imagine if we took Kalo out of the picture, what could replace it in old Hawaii? There was nothing that you could grow in, in flooded field systems. Arguably, you could say rice nowadays, but there was no rice in the old days. So if this came out, everything would shift. Everything, it's like removing this piece. It would, it would collapse and then you could rebuild something, but it wouldn't be the same. Um, so what that tells us is, as we're looking to restoring things the way the kupuna talk about the Hawaiian way, living on Hawaii lifestyle or looking at the moku system, it tells us that focusing on taro cultivation is gonna be really important um, for that reason. And uh, so I think Rob touched on this a little bit before, but we're really looking at um, ecosystem-based management. So we're, we're managing things on a whole system. We're not just managing the fish pond. We're not just managing the reefs out in the bay. We're not just managing the, the wetlands. We're managing one system together and uh, taro cultivation is a really important uh, aspect that uh, strings everything together. Um, so ultimately the research question for us, and I think Rob mentioned this earlier, is there are two different management approaches that we could look at managing this whole space at the, at the near. We could either just go with the typical um, agency approach based on contemporary e ecological restoration methods, or we could try to reapply these uh, more ancestral traditions in the area. And what are the ecosystem services that come out of these two, two different pathways? Uh, this is a before and after picture. The picture on the, the black and white on the left, I believe is from 1928. And this one's uh, from, from a few years back, um, you can see some key differences there. So the one that stands out in my mind, look at all this agriculture. So there's actually an ancient proverb associated with this area. It's mafuhu uh, ayohoi, which is a poetic reference to the superabundance of food that was created in this system. So I think a lot of this by 1928 had been converted to rice. Um, there's still some taro in here. You can see these are still taro lo'is, but probably a lot of rice in here. Um, it's hard to tell from the black and white aerial photo from 1928, but it's basically a mixture of rice and taro. But you can imagine when this was all taro, that's a lot of taro, it's feeding a lot of people. And the water that's flowing through this system was engineered in such a way through various canals and things that the storm water and excess water would flow down through here and other kinds of water could be managed to, to be let into the fish pond. You notice how dark this is? That's all primary productivity, phytoplankton and things like that. There are gonna be food for the baby fish, like the baby mullets and things like that. Um, so this is our template, what we're trying to get back to. Uh, I talked a lot about restoring to the future. Uh, when you talk about restoration, a lot of times people think that means going backwards in the past, but that's not really something that we can do. But what we can do is use the past as a as a template for our contemporary actions. So right now, this area has turned into a wetland that's been invaded by African grasses and uh, 
from Asian grasses and things like that. It's not producing any food. It's not bird habitat. It's not native fish habitat. Um, uh, the fish pond wall, uh, fish pond for many decades was kind of left alone. There was a flood in 1965. Um, as this whole system started to collapse when floods came through, or this whole system started to be abandoned, I think it was converted to sugarcane and pineapple, right, Rob, for a long time. Uh, so when floods came through, instead of being dispersed over the landscape and then kind of slowly uh, percolating off the landscape, um, my understanding is floodwaters just rushed through here. And so in 1965, because floodwaters weren't mitigated and spread out across the land, um, it actually breached the wall over here and then caused a break in the wall right about here, I think. Um, and since 1965, it's just been, every time there's a big flood, it brings in silt on this side and uh, the cycling wasn't happening, but the, the mix between in brackish water, uh, salt water and fresh water wasn't happening. The primary productivity, uh, look how dark this is. It's just, even now, it's not that dark. Um, so part of the restoration is looking at rest restoring the water flow, restoring the nutrient flow, restoring primary productivity in the pond, managing it in such a way so it's beneficial and things like that. Um, so what we see now, uh, for those of you who are familiar with the area and remember how it looked, uh, I think about 10, 15 years ago, this whole wall was covered in mangroves. And it was about, what year did they start cutting? 2012. 2012, they started removing the mangroves. 2002. 2002. 2002. So it looked like this whole stretch of wall, this is all wall over here. It looked like this on this side, but in 2002, they started clearing over here. Um, I think in this one, you still see the break in the wall. They cleared and then eventually fixed the break and have continued clearing. Uh, right now, the clearing activities, removal of invasive mangrove is in this area. So we're gonna take a look at this particular area and what it looked like before uh, the restoration activity. So this was the stream mouth in Higuilla. Uh I believe under here is where the old wall is, right Rob? This is Higuilla State Park. Can't even see the wall. So um, the trees have been breaking up the wall and constricting the stream mouth and uh, uh, limiting the circulation and uh, encouraging anaerobic environments, which is makes it difficult for the mullets to swim upstream. We know from the stories of the pupuna or the elders that the mullets and all kinds of fish would swim all the way up here, but um, ha that hadn't been observed in many generations, or a few generations. Um, so mangrove is introduced in Haiti and introduced in Hawaii. It's not something that's natural here. It's it becomes invasive. Um, so one of the challenges that we have is, you know, all over the world where people are trying to restore estuaries, they usually try to put mangrove back because mangrove is native there. But in Hawaii, it's not native here, so we're trying to remove mangroves. Um, but we have people questioning our activities because everywhere else in the world, um, they try to restore mangroves. So this is what it used to look like. Um, for those of you, this is the bridge you drive on that up until a few months ago, both sides were just closed canopy mangroves. And it's been like that uh, mangrove that was outplanted in 1922 uh, in that area. And so it's been a good 80 years or so that it's been only mangrove. So anybody 70 years old, 70 years old and younger, they've only known mangrove over here. And so it's those kinds of uh, people who have only seen mangrove, they say, hey, what's going on over there? It's not supposed to be like that. Um, but what the kupuna say, the elders say is, well, what it actually is supposed to be like is like this. And so we're trying to use the wisdom of the kupuna to restore back to uh, a, a situation like this where the landscape is productive and uh, producing food. And our role at the NIR is to do the monitoring and collect the data and demonstrate um, the, the different approaches and how they can uh, result in different sets of ecosystem services. Um, so this is a few pictures of mangrove in its native habitat. Uh, in its native, native habitat, mangrove has co-evolved in these ecosystems, in these places. And you look at their underwater root structures and they're just covered with uh, epiphytic growth, the sponges and clams and lots of their habitat for fish. Um, oh, here's another one. This, uh, Rob, what do you see in this picture? A whole suite of different invertebrates. <laughs> <laughs> whole suite of different invertebrates. Uh, and in all places all over the world, um, uh, like Thailand and other places in Southeast Asia, they're looking at mangrove for reforestation. But over there, this is how it grows. It's pretty, sh you know, maybe twice the size of a person, um, but they're relatively short. Uh, you get to mangrove in Hawaii, 
and it's out of control. So you look at their, their root structures, they're completely devoid of any kind of invertebrate, no sponges, no, no clams, no, no nothing, not even fish. Um, it's because these things didn't co-evolve here. So they're, they're our native species in Hawaii, um, they didn't evolve to grow in this kind of habitat. It grows really dense, it grows really tall, up to 80 feet. Um, the mangroves are up to 80 feet in Heia. And so taking them down is, is quite a feat. And you look in this area, it's just super dense root map. And one of the issues is that um, all of the leaf litter from up top, that all falls in here and then gets stuck. And then it starts to build and uh, causes anaerobic respiration and sucks oxygen out of the, night, the water and then the fish can't swim up anymore. And so it's really causing a lot of trouble. It's breaking up the fish pond walls and things like that. So these are the reasons why we've want, been wanting to remove them. Um, so in their native systems, uh, mangroves are really good. Uh, they've evolved there, their uh, protection uh, for the shoreline against erosion, storms and whatnot. Uh, they help to actually maintain water quality, remove nutrients, pollutants and sediments and so on. Important spawning grounds, uh, as you can see in the, some of the pictures below and juvenile hiding spots and all these endangered species down here in places like Florida and, and elsewhere. They're really important components of, of the system, but uh, not so much here. Um, also timber and fishing and shellfish, uh, things like that. But not so much in Hawaii. In Hawaii, for the most part, all mangroves do is facilitate the further incursion of more invasive species. So these, these are some of the invasive species that are associated with mangroves. We have um, uh, four-star general, five-star general. What's another name for that one, Rob? Uh, Flight sickness. Right, sick dead, um, tilapia, dojo loach, and not much native fish uh, in its roots. And so they are, the, they are destroying the fish pond walls, the root structure, the water quality is actually getting worse. So it's producing the opposite effect in Hawaii as it does in its uh, native systems. It does not provide nursery habitat for a native species. So even um, our friends and family would say, what are you doing? You know, we, we can talk to other Pacific Islanders where mangroves are native. Like, how can you be taking out the mangroves? They're so important for the juvenile fish. Well, not in Hawaii. The only juvenile fish that seem to be liking these things are invasive, more invasive species. Um, and the biodiversity is lower in mangrove areas. So in areas that mangroves are dominated now, you maybe have a species list of six, whereas um, in the old days, there was a species list of maybe 100 or, or more species in the area. Um, and it's not providing uh, fishing or timber or livestock. We do know from oral histories in the area and the stories of the kupuna or the elders that people used to fish off the bridge. Uh, they used to dive off the or jump off the bridge when they're kids and there's nobody been fishing over there since probably the 40s or 50s because uh, that's when the fish started disappearing because of the mangroves. Um, so it's been a useful exer exercise for us to go through some of the historical ecology, look at what the area used to be like uh, in the pre-human era and uh, you know the island, this area of the island is about two million years old, but it's only started looking like it does now for maybe 10,000 years ago at the end of the Pleistocene when the ice age, uh, uh, the end of the ice age uh, rise sea level, uh, sea water levels and things like that. Uh, it was definitely an open canopy uh, watershed area of native sedges, lots of waterfowl. Uh, these are some of the birds that uh, we know would have been in here, the koloa, alaiula, like Ke'o Ke'o, Ai'o, um, and fish like Ama Ama, Ohopu, and Ahole Hole, and lots of other things. So this is what would have been here in the pre-human era. Um, then about 1500 years ago, our ancestors started arriving in these islands and transformed landscapes. Um, but one of the ways that uh, Pacific Islanders, or indi indigenous people in general, but uh, Pacific Islanders specifically, they look at these highly productive um, ecotones, uh, riparian areas, estuaries, where you can, that's highly productive for food. And you start to expand that and stabilize it, but do so in such a way that it doesn't uh, exclude uh, native biodiversity that's associated with it. So even though you take uh, a tar patch, is, tar field is basically an expanded riparian area, um, but that, all that does is increase waterfowl habitat. So an interesting uh, paleo ecology note that I uh, like to cite is that Alaiula, or the, the uh, mud hen, one with the red bill, that's in danger now, it's a native bird, but it doesn't even occur in the fossil record until after uh, human occupation of Hawaii. And it's not that it showed up in some mid-in or some fire pit, it's that 
uh, it showed up in a sinkhole, but it was never even, there's no evidence of it before human activity, but the reason is because when you take a valley floor and convert it to this, you're exponentially expanding its habitat, then you start to have a light hula all over the place, they start to fall in sinkholes, and then 1,500 years later, a, a paleoecologist can dig it up and, and talk about it. Um, but that's an example, you know, there's a notion that humans are intrinsically bad for native species, native systems, but there are lots of examples of how uh, a lot of species that are endangered nowadays are actually the height of their populations were during the, during the Hawaiian era. Um, then the territorial era came, as, as, we, as I mentioned, a lot of the area went into sugarcane and pineapple, uh, sugarcane probably first and pineapple second. Um, there are a lot of changes in land use, urbanization, deforestation, things like that, dredging in the bay, um, and there was rapid habitat deterioration uh, from in the modern era from the 1920s to the 1960s. Um, so here's a graph down here. This is the coral cover graph. Is that right, Rob? Yeah. So this is coral cover in Kanye Bay, uh, based on uh, uh, current monitoring, historic monitoring, and modeling uh, that. Uh, points back to an era before monitoring was actually happening. It shows that in the Hawaiian era, um, coral cover might have had an initial drop off, but remained pretty high and stable, uh, slightly increased. Uh, but then uh, when agriculture came in and silt, there was a lot of siltation off the land because of uh, poor man land management practices that co started covering the reefs and there's a big drop in uh, coral over here and then dredging happened and the, the sewage in the bay happened and this, this huge collapse. Things started to recover a little while and it's been up and down since. Um, but the point of this slide I think is that there was an era, there was a long uh, era of human occupation, human habitation of the area that coexisted with healthy coral reefs and that's what we're trying to get back to. Um, and then later in the 20th century we had all of these invasive species coming in and dominating and displacing native species. Um, and the, the, the area isn't providing the services that it used to for soil uh, retention and, and storms and providing food and things like that. So what we're trying to get back to is we're trying to restore and not restore back to the way it used to be, but as I was saying, but use the, the practices, the thinking, the knowledge of the past to inform our way forward. Um, so pulling together community members uh, trying to inspire the younger generations of, of, of community members and Native Hawaiians to follow in our footsteps. Uh, and our role is to do the research that will provide the data that can uh, influence policy in the future. Um, and we're having a lot of success, even just recently in the past year that a lot of the mangroves have been removed out of the stream mouth and in the area along the bridge, we've had a return of uh, Native species it's been generations since anybody's seen Alai Ula uh, and Aio in the area, generations literally since anybody's seen these birds, they're now coming back. Um, and they're coming back because uh, Native Hawaiian groups and community members are coming together to restore the area. Um, the fish are starting to swim up the stream again and almost making it to the bridge um, where people used to fish from in the old days. So hopefully our continued work will, will get them to a point where they can migrate further inland like they would have in the old days. Uh, Opu are coming back and the Koloa, I'm not sure whether Koloa, did, did they disappear for a while or whether it was, I don't they know. They were just not as common. Yeah, not as common, but they're certainly coming back now um, in impressive numbers. Um, so we are doing large scale restoration. Uh, some of it's happening pretty quickly, which has been raising some eyebrows uh, in the community. Um, but on the Bauka side of the bridge, the Kako Uibi land, this is what it looked like uh, maybe in February of this year. Uh, it started clearing, and this is what it looked like uh, at the end of the summer. And it now, actually, all of these trees are gone. So this is all just uh, wetland. All the roots are still in the ground, but the above ground parts of the trees have been removed. Um, and some people have been worried about what that's going to uh, look like for there's been concern that this is gonna cause a massive uh, erosion and of, of silt going into the bay. So one of the things that we've been doing is monitoring that to see we have baseline assessments that Rob set up uh, last year before any of this work happened to look at what the sediment is doing out in the reef. Um, but again, trying to get back to this. So this area over here, look at all those trees, 80 feet tall, literally 80 feet tall, about this big around, uh, planted in 1922, up to this 
um, but it used to look like this. Productive agricultural lands, uh, native fish all over the place, native uh, waterfowl all over the place. Um, it's another picture from another vantage point. You can see a lot of the taro and rice that was grown in 1927. Uh, trying to get back to that, again, is the, the keystone component of this Hawaiian social ecological system that a lot of us have been looking at. Um, but maybe I'll turn it back to you, Rob, to that. So from the research side, really what we're trying to do is understand, as humans, most of us want something from nature. When, whether that is a feeling of well-being, whether that is biodiversity, whether that is conservation, whether that is food, there is something that most humans value intrinsically about nature. And what we want to try and do with this ecosystem-based approach is ask, what is the management strategy that gives people the most of what they want from nature? And there are lots of different groups that want different things. So whether that is food uh, uh, security, or whether that is ocean recreation, or whether that is bird watching, whether it is you know, freedom of choice and a sense of well-being and the, the ability to see na nature and natural systems, whether that is, is community or economics, we want to try and evaluate all of those things in this place and ask the question, what management strategy works best for the people of Kaneohe, the people of Heia? If we take these different approaches and we try and compare them, what gives you and me and our families and our communities more of what we want from this place? The alien invasive mangroves and California grass that have completely covered that area right now, or if we restore the area to an ahupua system, do people get more of the things that they want out of this area and does it provide a better strategy that maybe we can convince other people elsewhere to apply a management strategy more like this. Could we learn from the past, from the Hawaiian culture that had a population equivalent to what we have today in Kaneohe in this place and live sustainably off the land, when today our estimates of how long we can live without mats and food bringing, uh, mats and bringing us in some food to Safeway is about a week. Um, that is a little bit of a disturbing thought for a lot of people in the community, and it provides a lot less services. And so we believe that actually we can learn from the past and that this can be an example for elsewhere in Hawaii and elsewhere in the Pacific. So with that, um, this is a general overview of the project, the ideas, the management strategy, and would like to open it up to any questions that anyone